So it's been really interesting to hear all about genetics and the advances in technology from a medical perspective. Um, and you know, I, I am a population geneticist, so I'm a scientist who works on genetics as well, and I've worked on humans in the past as well. But when I moved back to India to start my job, I felt like there's a lot of other species uh, on this planet which also have DNA and have very interesting stories to tell. So um, as David mentioned, I'm Uma, and I'm interested in trying to use genetic information uh, to think about conservation and biodiversity of several species. I'll give you some examples of my work with the iconic uh, tiger. So this is a tiger uh, from the central part of India. And like I said, what I do is I try and read stories written in DNA to understand the past of tigers, uh, and I hope that this understanding of the past will allow us to think about or kind of carve out potentially a future for uh, populations of tigers to exist in the wild uh, in, in the future. So uh, one of the first studies we did was we actually looked uh, at tiger populations across India. We looked at their DNA. Uh, and through their genetic variation, we were able to show that you know, even 200 or so years ago, uh, the Indian subcontinent was chock full of tigers, lots of tigers all over the place. But around 200 years ago, there was a population crash, and now we only have one of 10 tigers left. And they're kind of scattered in these small little orange pockets that you see, the remaining habitats. So only 7% of tiger habitat remains today, uh, and all of these you know, few tigers are now scrunched into these small populations. But we were also curious about whether we've actually lost particular types of tigers. So we lost a lot of tigers. But did we lose any unique genetic variants or unique types of tigers in the ones that died? So in order to do this, we have to, have to go back in time. right? We have to go back uh, and look at tigers from 200 years ago. And we were able to do this because DNA is so stable and it stays on for so long. We were able to look at tiger skins. So this is a picture of a skin from the London Museum of Natural History. It's a 200-year-old tiger from Afghanistan. Uh, and we were able to take small bits of DNA, small bits of tissue uh, from this animal, uh, extract DNA, and compare uh, extinct tiger DNA, in a sense, to, the, those, to that of tigers around today. And this showed us that actually we've lost a lot of genetic variants, um, and very few remain in tiger populations today. It also told us, I think, something more interesting, that certain populations of tigers, like the desert tigers, have become completely isolated from the rest of the Indian subcontinent. So it's important because tigers in the desert, now there's only one population left. Uh, individuals there tend to be inbred. So uh, there's high levels of relatedness between tigers there. And so if you're thinking about uh, their future, I'm not sure how optimistic we can be for a future for that particular population, say. So looking at their DNA allowed us to actually infer that they've been through this population crash, they've lost a lot of variants, um, and there are some populations now which are kind of cut off, isolated, potentially heading towards extinction. So then, uh, is there a future for tigers at all? Is it just that they're on this path to extinction and that's just where they're going to go? So we asked this question using simulations. We actually tried and modeled tiger genetic variation into the future. And we actually tried to understand how could there be a future, uh, a genetic future for tigers. Uh, and what we found was that the only way uh, tiger va genetic variation could survive is if actually tigers were able to freely move across the Indian subcontinent. So I told you that you know some populations were cut off in the last 200 years. So if there was some way, some highways, or some way the tigers could actually move around uh, the Indian subcontinent, it would be possible for this variation to survive. So that sounds uh, really nice, but it's uh, a little difficult to <laughs> imagine that happening in a country of more than a billion people, and predictions that you know, in 40 years, 60% of India will be urban. I mean, that's kind of very, um, it's, it's very intense to think about. And around this time, uh, I was actually doing field work uh, in a park uh, called Taroba. It's in central India. And I actually watched a territorial fight between two males. So you can see here, these two males are actually fighting with each other. Uh, and I was immediately curious as to where one of these individuals is from. So clearly, tigers are territorial. You know, they have their homes or territories. And potentially, one of these individuals was coming in from the outside. So maybe tigers were moving. 
You know, we don't know how, how far they're moving, but maybe they were potentially moving. So again, you know, as always, if I, if I have a question, I try to go back to DNA. And so I thought, well, how can we study tiger movement uh, using their genes or genetic information again? So we did that in this small uh, part of India, in the central part. Uh, and we actually were able to get uh, DNA from tigers in these different locations. And then we were able to show uh, the tigers are actually moving pretty far in this landscape. So, it, so the way you do it, it's like forensics, right? So if you go to a particular location, you sample tigers from there, and you ask genetically, are those tigers from there, are they native, or are they immigrants from somewhere else? Okay? Uh, and we were able to kind of uh, deconstruct some amount of movement in this landscape. And more interestingly, we were able to ask uh, what elements of the land may promote or retard movement. Okay? So our results suggested then that human footprint, so basically cities, roads, etc., actually retard movement of tigers uh, and make it harder for them to get from place A to place B. So now I told you earlier on that uh, the only way for tigers to have a future if they, is if they can freely move across the Indian subcontinent. This is just a small bit of this landscape, right? So if, if I want to try and understand whether they can actually move across the Indian subcontinent, I need a lot more data. Okay? So here, since it's a small piece of land, I was able to use a few bits of information to figure out whether a tiger was native or not. So what we'd like to do now is actually try and look at tiger genomes. Luckily for us, uh, someone in, a scientist in Korea has sequenced the tiger genome. And so the genome is available. But the other problem we have is, so far, we've basically been using tiger feces as a source of DNA. Okay? So I've actually been walking through forests, collecting tiger feces, and extracting DNA from it, finding out all these secrets about what's happening uh, in tiger populations. So going ahead, like I said, we'd like to maybe develop a SNP chip for tigers. So just like you heard uh, from Anne, 23andMe has basically looks at many, many variants or SNPs or mutations. Why can't we do the same thing for tigers? We'd get a lot more information on where they are from, potentially um, what diseases they may be predisposed to, whether they are inbred and so on. So personalized genomics for tigers, if you will. Uh, and the challenge, of course, will be to do this with a very bad source of DNA, which is feces. So if your genome is like a book, uh, feces is like a torn up book. The DNA is degraded, it's not in good shape. Um, but it might be possible to use, again, bioinformatic approaches where you have you know, missing data and so on, but you try and infer patterns from these data. Now, the other thing is that, okay, so we have all this technology. We can actually you know, figure out where a tiger is from and so on. Suppose we get all this done. Uh, the truth is that the landscape itself is changing, right? So the land is changing. So what we're trying to do is actually also model the future of these landscapes. So this is a picture from uh, um, central eastern India. So it's pretty forested. You can see the green is forest. And those uh, black kind of uh, uh, enclosures are protected areas. And uh, predictions for this area, for example, are that you know, in, 20, in 200 years, you'll have a lot of loss of forest. And you will have isolated populations in red, for example and generally a loss of forest cover. So if this happens to the landscape, can we actually infer what will happen to connectivity or the chance of movement for tigers? And the hope is then that we can avoid things like isolated tiger populations and the loss of variation. Because uh, like I said, you know, with more than a, a billion people uh, with aspirations for increased economic growth development, it's uh, very hard to avoid things like roads and urban centers in India. So uh, trying and understanding how these landscapes will change and how that change might affect tigers and their connectivity is something we're trying to do. So uh, I guess you know, I, I kind of will leave you with this thought. I mean, there's only 2,000 tigers, 3,000 tigers left in the world, in the wild. There's many, many more in zoos. And I guess we could have them survive in captivity, and that would be enough. But in a sense, it's a challenge to think about uh, a, an area like India, which is so crowded, but yet can actually maintain biodiversity. 
So one way to think about it is from a genetic perspective, to try and manage uh, or think about tigers moving uh, in the context of crowded landscapes. And we're really hoping that using technology like genomics uh, and modeling of landscapes, uh, we can try and at least come up with uh, options for how this may be possible. The ultimate question then is, of course, you know, are development and tiger movement both possible? Um, I don't know the answer to that. It depends on how ready we also are to see a tiger in our backyard, for example, um, <laughs> because that's what it's going to come to in the end, uh, and how willing we are to live with wildlife. Uh, but I hope uh, that at least with uh, our work, we can move towards answering some of the questions which might make it possible. Thank you.